Hi, I'm Max Jones with my co-host Diego Ramos, and today we're talking to Sam Husseini about his critiques of presidential candidate RFK Jr., which are the most substantive and unique that we've encountered in independent media. While most people criticize Kennedy almost entirely on his hawkish, hawkish positions on Israel-Palestine, Husseini goes deeper, pointing out Kennedy's silence on issues such as the appointment of Welcome Trust Director Jeremy Farrar as chief scientist of the WHO and, his, and um, Kennedy's hesitance to hold actors like Farrar and Fauci accountable for their propagandistic cover-up of COVID origins. We use these critiques in our conversation as a catalyst to talk about the role that these seemingly anti-establishment candidates like RFK play during election seasons, functioning as sheepdogs and Judas goats, leading the disaffected anti-establishment sex of the public into the slaughterhouses of the party duopoly. Make sure to like, comment, and share this video if you found it interesting so we can fight the algorithm that really heavily suppresses voices like ours at SharePost and important journalists like Sam. You can find more of Sam's work at husseini.substack.com. Enjoy the interview. Hi, Sam. Thanks for joining us. Thanks so much for inviting me, gentlemen. Of course. So in one of your latest articles, you use the metaphor of RFK Jr. potentially being a Judas goat. And I'm... You know, I've personally never heard of this before. And looking it up, I was quite shocked at the origins of the of the metaphor. And you say that instead of being a sheepdog like past candidates like Bernie Sanders, RFK Jr. evokes this kind of new spirit. Um, can you define what a what a Judas goat is and elaborate why you think RFK potentially fits into this role? Well, it's um, you know, it's from farming. Uh, Judas goat is a goat that gets the sheep to go into the slaughterhouse and then they get slaughtered and he walks and the Judas goat walks off and it, they're typically tobacco addicted um, and they get their tobacco fix as a reward for their services. Um, I, I, you know, it was Bruce Dixon of Black Agenda Report who coined the term sheepdog, I believe. And uh, so we have this history of these of movements happening, like say Occupy, uh, for economic, you know, equality, and then they get funneled into a um, campaign of some sort, a presidential campaign, and the presidential campaign takes up a lot of time and energy and resources, um, as for example Sanders did, and ends up with fundamentally nothing or very little. Um, RFK could be something worse than that because he not only i mean sanders you know put economic inequality on the map it's now commonly understood and he deserves some credit for that um and he didn't do a ton of damage on other issues i mean i certainly criticized him on other issues at the time in 2016 and before and after but he didn't do damage per se on any issues rfk jr is doing damage on multiple fronts um, and I, I think what needs to happen is that anti-establishment forces have to unify from the left and the right. I've long talked about, you know, we, we can get into this, how the left and right can cooperate, um, anti-establishment forces and RFK Jr. is splintering them. And he's doing this primarily in two ways. One on his Israel stance, uh, which is incredibly pro-Israel. I mean, he's probably the most pro-Israel politician, national politician since Gingrich, I guess, um, in the U.S. Uh, he might have exceeded Gingrich at this point in his rhetoric. Um, and by not addressing the pandemic issues as one would expect. I'd, I've done a lot of work over the last three years about COVID origins. And a lot of people... Um, who I respect, um, uh, Victor Wallace, a prominent socialist uh, author, were very um, excited uh, about Kennedy's um, campaign because he would at least bring to public discussion a lot of issues around the pandemic. Um, and there are a lot of issues around the pandemic. My main issue is COVID origins. He hasn't really done that. Um, so he's not even really doing that. But, you know, he's going to raise a lot of money. Um, and he's, you know, um, he's got a lot of his, uh, you know, his daughter-in-law is a former CIA agent, and she's apparently in, in charge of his social media. 
Um, and he's schmoozing with these pro-Israeli big wigs and other uh, big wigs, you know, and getting money for that and has appointed uh, uh, this fellow Klein, who's with the American Zionist organization on, on his campaign. So it, he's doing a lot of things that are probably going to help him, but they could be very detrimental to not just the Palestinian cause, but also to other causes that, that are very near and dear to the hearts of sincere people who uh, had placed a lot of hope on his candidacy. And that's why he's he's more of a um, Judas goat in your eyes than Sanders was, right? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, potentially. I mean, we're still early here, but so far, and and I mean, you know, it's crucial how you formulate the campaign early on, right? He got into all of these discussions about whether or not vaccines cause autism, which has nothing to do with COVID. You know, we just went through one of the most cataclysmic events in modern human history, a pandemic that put much of the planet in a lockdown for a prolonged period of time. Um, uh, there's a, there was obviously a massive propaganda effort to dismiss the possibility that it came out of, that it had lab origin. Um, and you would think that he would be jumping on those issues and he's not doing that. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think a number of things that he's doing cause me to say he's worse than he's potentially worse than a sheepdog. He's potentially what I call a Judas goat. I, I, I believe I'm the first person to, well, I could be wrong, uh, you know, to, to, to apply it as a political metaphor. Uh, but I think it's apt. Yeah. Um, and there's been a lot of speculation about uh, RFK Jr.'s backing of Israel. Like I remember when, when it first happened, I was pretty shocked hearing how, um, you know, crazy a lot of the things he was say saying was because it was it was so overtly propagandistic and uh not nuanced at all that it was it was so weird hearing this guy that was um, taking these kind of, um, you know, dissenting positions on really important issues uh, from the establishment's perspective, like COVID and uh, the Ukraine war, hearing him talk about Israel like this, mm -hmm. especially because he's always railing against neocons. And I mean, like, you know, the roots of neoconservatism have a, conservatism have a lot to do with Israel, with things like PNAC and um, Oper Operation a, a Clean Break and uh, things like that. So, um, you, you know, what do you what do you make of RFK's junior backing of Israel? Is it there's people that think it's a knee jerk response to uh, the accusations of anti-Semitism when he made that uh, comment about the bio warfare weapons? There's other people that think he's controlled by the Israel lobby or is he kind of or is this really just like a like a, a cynical ploy, uh, like some people have speculated to divide the as you call it, the anti-establishment, anti-war, pro civil liberties sect of the. Uh, political sphere. Yeah, my, my fear is that it's the last thing, which is incredibly useful for the establishment. Um, I should put a little context into this. Um, you know, we, we talk about, you know, past sheepdogs, you know, that extends back to Jesse Jackson, Dennis Kucinich, um, you, you might say John Edwards, um, uh, and then Sanders as sheepdogs. Um, I wrote a piece sort of reverse engineering the 2020 election. And what I argued there was that if you look at what happened in the 2020 election, who was in the race and who got out of the race and when they got out of the race, like there, there were a bunch of people that got out just before Super Tuesday in order to help ensure that Joe Biden got the nomination. I, I think that you, you, you have an orchestrated process inside the primary process uh, that very much serves the interests of the establishment. So I come at analyzing Kennedy's run, not just because of Kennedy, but because of my past experience with uh, how these elections pan out. So part of that is because he's in the Democratic Party, you're saying, basically. Yeah. Although, you know, I mean, I got a critique of West, <laughs> Cornell West as well, who's 
you know, outside uh, the Democratic Party, presumably. Um, but what 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 Kennedy is doing is splintering anti-establishment forces, right? It, 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 what, what people who are you know traditionally anti-war, anti-imperialist have a lot more in common with people who are critical of much of the establishment COVID narrative than many of them think. And there needed to be a way of getting them to dialogue. Um, I mean, t- take, for example, the, the, the issue of censorship, right? Um, can, you know, first off, I mean, Kennedy's pro-Israel statements, public statements, predated the so-called anti-Semitic remarks that he made about um, uh, about uh, uh, biowarfare, about ethnic biowarfare. Um, and I would argue that him talking about it in terms of ethnic biowarfare was a very counterproductive way to talk about dangerous lab work, right? I mean, dangerous lab work, what's euphemistically called gain-of-function lab work, uh, involves making viruses more deadly. They do this at the University of Wisconsin, at the University of North Carolina, at other universities in the United States and around the world. The NIH and the Pentagon and USAID fund this work. It's a complete, massive, mind-boggling scandal that is an existential threat to humanity. And you would expect Kennedy to be putting that case forward. Instead, he goes off on this completely tangential thing, which might have some significance, but is incredibly minor and is the most tenuous part of the equation to talk about ethnic bioweapons undermining the entire case. And then he um, is supposed to testify before Congress a couple of days after that about, um, uh, about censorship. Um, He puts aside his prepared remarks, which had some good content in them about censorship uh, and goes on this tirade about how much of a great supporter he is of Israel. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, that could be a coincidence or it might not be a coincidence. Um, furthermore, th- there are deep seated connections here that are completely obscured in this equation. For example, censorship, big tech censorship was Palestine was a major target of it before the pandemic. And then anybody who stepped out of line, or a lot of people who stepped out of line in terms of pan, the pandemic narrative became the primary targets of it. So there's a deep-seated connection to make between uh, the cause of standing up for Palestinian rights and questioning um, uh, pandemic narrative. That gets totally obscured by what Kennedy is doing. Um and also, um, there were mainstream reports over the years that Israel had cooperated with South Africa in its biological weapons program. Israel is one of the few countries that has not signed the Bioweapons Convention. Uh, the U.S. and other countries, I argue, are violating it, in effect, by trying to find loopholes in it. But they've signed it. They've ratified it. Um Israel hasn't signed it, and it worked with apartheid South Africa, uh, apparently. Um, You have mainstream reports in the British press about this over the years in in attempting to develop um, ethnic bioweapons. Obviously, South Africa wanted ethnic, apartheid South Africa wanted ethnic bioweapons to target blacks um, and uh, Israel to target Arabs. Uh, They seem not to have succeeded in that quest, but they tried. Um, so, it, so a lot of what Kennedy does is really serving the establishment in incredibly insidious ways. Now, is this conscious or is he being pushed in various directions by various people? What explains his not talking about gain of functional? He has a book coming out, you know, what happened in Wuhan, uh, sort of a follow-up to his Fauci book, which had some good information in it. I read it. Um, but it's possible that his book on Wuhan will try to pin the blame for COVID largely on China and Mm. let much of the establishment off the hook. A lot of people are concerned about that. I haven't read the book. 
Um, and um, so I don't, I don't know, but I don't think that the way that he's acted in terms of the origins of his, um, you know, because I got into COVID origins issues, I followed Christian uh, Children's Health Defense, his group, fairly closely over the last three years. And they have this person, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on her name, it's Vera something. Um, uh, Vera Shavav, Sharav. Um, she's a medical activist and a Nazi, uh, survivor of the Nazi Holocaust. And she did a bunch of documentaries of them that were focusing on Israel in utterly bizarre ways. Focusing on, on what in the documentaries? Israel. And oh, how okay. Israel was, you know, highly vaccinated, which is perfectly true. Um, but it talked about the vaccine process in the most hyperbolic, like, like, like you know, like it was a mass extermination thing. Uh, that, you know, and that, you know, the, that it was in effect a new Holocaust and the vaccines were primarily k- killing Jews. They never quite said that, but that was the framing of things. And it was utterly bizarre. Um, And so it became clear to me. So that sort of put the question in my mind. So I started saying, okay, what's Kennedy's position on Israel, given that they're putting out this and really promoting this documentary. And then I think on Israel Day, before he said anything, he he put a picture of himself on his Twitter feed with her, with this woman, uh, Vera, um, you know, saying, Happy Israel Day. So I was like, okay, so something, something's going on here. Uh, so I, th- I think I was the first person to ask the question uh, about what's going on with Israel and Kennedy, you know, in, many months ago. Um, so, you know, and since then he's put this guy Klein, who's with the American Zionist organization as an advisor and hang, been hanging around with this completely nut job, scandal ridden rabbi, schmoly something. Um, and I believe that some of his funders are strong Zionists and they also fund um, uh, DeSantis. He has mm. high, strong Zionist um, uh, mutual funders with DeSantis. Um, the uh, one other factor on the Israel side of the equation before we get to other stuff is for the general election, there's this group called No Labels, uh, which bills itself as sort of an alternative to the two-party duopoly. But it's in effect an attempt to, I believe, solidify the establishment by giving by pretending to give an alternative, but it's actually a pro-establishment alternative. And it was actually founded by Joe Lieberman. It's a, it's a political party. It's not a political party yet. It's like everything, but a political, it's positioning itself to potentially field candidates, but it's not officially Uh. a political party yet. I even heard it the other day. I was listening to Sputnik and the Sputnik radio in the car and they, they were buying it. They, 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 they thought that, uh, no labels might be an uh, alternative to the to the duopoly. It's not. It's Joe Lieberman. Joe Lieberman is the establishment. Joe Lieberman is you know a diehard pro. So it's it's like saying, oh, we're going to get beyond partisan politics, but we're going to give you, you know, somebody like Liz Cheney, or or conceivably <laughs> or conceivably somebody like Kennedy, uh, if they can mold him to their liking. Um, you know, a lot of my analysis here is also informed by how I, I've written two long pieces over the last year, um, historical pieces, one about Albright when she died, uh, Madeleine Albright, who was Secretary of State for a time, and just seeing the trajectory of U.S. foreign policy over the decades, and one on Jimmy Carter. And the conclusions that I came to looking at those two figures and I think it extends to every other major political figure, is that they're all used by the establishment. You know, they're all instrumentalized. So Jimmy Carter can come in and say, I care about human rights and peace. And then the establishment lets him work on human rights and peace in a way that furthers the establishment's interests. So he'll, um, you know, uh, 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 
he will uh, fund the Mujahideen. They started funding them in Afghanistan under Carter, not under Reagan. Brzezinski brags about this, his national security advisor. Uh, Peace, they did the Camp David Accords. If you listen to serious strategists of the Middle East, they'll say the Camp David Accords sowed the seeds for the Gulf Wars, uh, for the wars against Iraq, you know, just geopolitically. So, you know, Trump, you know, is America first, but he's not America first in a good way, in my view. He's America first in a bad way. You could have a good America first, in my view, somebody who actually, you know, who tells U.S. companies you have to begin your meetings with a pledge of allegiance and you have to work in the interest of the American public. Trump didn't do that. Um, so, again, I try not to fall in love or hate with politicians. You know, the establishment instrumentalizes them. I think we have to instrumentalize them. What do we get out of this guy? Can, can Kennedy's campaign stop gain of function, dangerous lab work? Okay, make it do that. Let's use it to that end. That'll benefit humanity. That's not happening. He's not doing that. Yeah, and kind of following up on that in terms of furthering the establishment interest and how you mentioned his new book will kind of, you know, uh, put blame on China in terms of COVID origins. Do you, and this, you know, this is kind of veering off into speculation, but it just made me think about how, especially uh, actually our, our, our boss, Bob Shear just did a podcast with Jody Evans about the New York Times uh, smear piece on her that, you know, her husband and her some somehow, you know, taking money from, from China, but it's clear that there's a sort of manufacturing of consent for a war with China coming up from the establishment. So do you think that maybe this could fall in line uh, neatly for RFK, this kind of anti-China rhetoric and stance? It could, absolutely. It could, absolutely. And I mean, it might be outright war or it could be, you know, something short of outright war, but still in effect targeting China, in effect demonizing China. I mean, we didn't get the Ukraine war until, you know, Russia had been demonized for several years with Russiagate and other things. So, you know, it could be a prolonged process, but the demonization process, Kennedy, what he's saying could fit into. Just as what he's doing on in terms of Israel could lay the groundwork for, you know, I mean, you know, I mean, the Palestinian people have had it bad, but they could have it a lot worse. I mean, you, you, you know, under some set of circumstances, you could have Israel attempt another expulsion of Palestinians, for example. What Kennedy's doing is helping lay the groundwork for something like that, potentially. Right. And uh, I just want to bring up Cornell West as well. Um, sure. as you've commented that he's sort of the inverse of RFK, where he's good on Israel and Palestine, but uh, he's kind of stayed a bit quiet on, on in terms of COVID and, and dealing with that, the establishment side of that. Right. Um, so in your opinion, where do you think that, and maybe, you know, something like Vote Pack can come up in this, um, where do you think the law, the line can be drawn for candidates to make political concessions uh, versus, you know, what they truly stand for? Yeah, I mean, again, I mean, I'm going by what Kennedy is saying publicly. I mean, there are probably some people who think, no, oh, Kennedy actually is a critic of Israel and he'll stab him in the back <laughs> once he gets him done. You know? <laughs> I, mean, I mean, we heard that with Obama, too. You know, I mean, it was uh, it was a joke with me in 2008. I was like, in Obama's lies, we trust. You know, we all <laughs> trust that Obama is lying when he says pro establishment stuff. OK, that didn't work out too well. Um, so, I mean, I'm going by what he's saying publicly. Um, um, so, uh, I'm sorry, I'm probably not getting to your, to your question cause that was just a, such a digression about that, that little joke. <laughs> no. Yeah. I'm just, I'm just curious what, I mean, like personally, you think that where can, where can politicians really, you know, stand for what they truly believe in versus, you know, what right. they they're going to, the sacrifices they're going to have to make. Well, I mean, and also, um, sorry. And, and also, uh, if you could also comment on, um, uh, cause most, most people that are supporters of West that, I, uh, that I've seen, um, and I've been kind of, you know, my personal bias is more towards West than Bobby Kennedy, but COVID is a very important issue to me. And I've noticed that I've only seen Cornell West really talk about COVID when he's forced to, and he doesn't really say much 
controversial stuff about it. Um, and by controversial, I mean going against the establishment narrative on it. So also touch, if you could like touch on why you think it's important for a candidate like West to actually, you know, take those risky stances on something like COVID um, if he's serious about standing up to the establishment. Yeah. I, I you know, um, people should say what they think and they should also listen um you know to what the people are saying um and you know it would have been easy for kennedy to to adopt sanders position on israel for example you know if you if you just think that he was trying to get the democratic nomination that would have been the obvious thing to do and then he would think that he would get some support that sanders got and build on that he didn't do that um west in terms of his rhetoric has certainly been you know, pro-Palestinian. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, th- there are a lot of ways that West, if he educated himself on the pandemic issues, could do things. I mean, I did a ton of research on pandemic origins. And one of my conclusions was that two of the scientists who um, dismissed the possibility of lab origins were Robert Gary and Christian Anderson, uh, Gary at Tulane and Anderson at Scripps Research. They co they were the two main authors of the paper called Proximal Origins, which came out in early 2020 and was the major prop one of the two major pillars of propaganda that COVID and, and the more powerful one really that COVID could not have lab origin. They are the president and vice president of a um, of a U.S. lab facility in West Africa that West Africans at the time said might have caused the 2014 Ebola outbreak, which killed 11,000 people and was probably the biggest crisis of 2014. Wait, what were they president and vice president of in West Africa, where? Uh, It's called the Viral Hemorrhagic Fever Consortium. It's based in Kenema, South Africa, in Kenema, Sierra Leone. Um, And uh, it is uh, US lab facilities there uh, that work on hemorrhagic fevers Ebola is one of hemorrhagic fevers, as is Lhasa. And uh, I wrote a 12,000 word article on this with Jonathan Latham, who's a virologist, um, fleshing out maybe if you want to have another episode where where we just go into this because it's, you know. Yeah, yeah, that would be great. It's a huge deal. Um, uh, They were part of the Ebola response. Not not the response. They might have caused it. Oh, wow. Okay. Okay. They, 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 they. The allegation is that they were tinkering with something over there, that they were doing some kind of lab work, and that they are the the, the dominant story is that it was a boy playing with bats in a village called Miliandu, Little Emil, Um, and it's just over the border in Guinea from Sierra Leone, so that they got it over the border so that to frame Guinea as the source, so that the source isn't Sierra Leone, where the U.S. labs are. Uh, the, mm. uh, the, the, uh, the team that claim, made this claim didn't find any Ebola in the village. They claimed that it was bats that were in a burnt out tree. There was a fire and all the bats went away that had Ebola that killed little Emil and that he was the first Ebola case. There had never been a case of Ebola in this part of Africa. Ebola is endemic to Central Africa, which is a thousand miles away. So there was a magic bat that flew a thousand miles, didn't have any outbreaks between uh, Central Africa and West Africa, and then caused this, wow. caused this outbreak. And Africans at the time were dismissed as nut job, ignorant conspiracy theorists for saying this at the time. And it seems like they were the canary in the coal mine. It's remarkably similar to um, what happened with Wuhan, which, you know, the, the, the nearest genetic relatives are in caves uh, a thousand miles away from Wuhan. Um, and uh, and it's the same set of virologists who are all taking NIH and Pentagon and USAID money who are causing the problems and then covering them up. This is a major issue. This, you know, the one good thing 
about a nuclear war is that you know that it happened. You could be in the middle of a bio war and you wouldn't know it. Uh, and, and there's precursors on this in Cuba. Some of these scientists that I've dug up have been accused by Cuba of spreading dengue fever there. And the U.S. response is prove it. Oh, you have a dengue fever outbreak. You have a swine flu outbreak. That's, that's so sad. That's so sad. Maybe we can help you with that, you know, because you can't prove that it, you know, by, by, you know, people say that biological warfare is a, a poor man's weapon. It's not. It has a unique feature, deniability. Mm. Deni- but, you know, they've had these, you know, very few and limited uh, hearings on COVID origins. And that's what, you know, they, they had a guy from MIT say. Oh, why, why, why are the U.S. and China involved in this? This is a poor man's weapon. It's not a poor man's weapon. It can be used in very insidious ways. It's, in effect, a covert weapon. So C- Cornell West, I would hope, would educate himself about, I mean, it dovetails incredibly with this, you know, how black people have been targeted throughout history and how they're the canary in the coal mine if Cornell West would educate himself about something like the Ebola outbreak in 2014. A lot of my work relied on a journalist. Uh, you might want to have him on, Cherno Ba. Uh, he just got his PhD at Northwestern University. He's, uh, he runs the Africanist Press. He's kind of become the WikiLeaks of West Africa. He, you know, he's always releasing uh, internal government documents showing corruption in Sierra Leone. And he wrote a book about the 2014 Ebola outbreak. Great guy. Um, you know, um, so there are, there are people doing good work. Um, and, you know, so what we need yeah. to do is use presidential campaigns to force a presidential candidate to pay attention to the issues that really need addressing and then to give voice to them, to use them as a vehicle to do real public education, at least, if not outright win. If you're not going to win, at least do massive public education. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, um, the it's really interesting what you're saying. I, this is all new information to me ab- about the Ebola outbreak. But I do know that um, the Welcome uh, Trust, mm-hmm. which um, Jeremy Farrar was the director of, I think before he was the chief scientist of the WHO. Correct. Um, uh, ha- which has links to the Jenner Institute at Oxford, um, which was... Uh, one of the players involved in creating, I think, a vaccine for the Ebola outbreak. And a lot of people thought that the COVID outbreak was the first time that, um, uh, you know, there was this pandemic response where we have to rush a vaccine through the regulatory process because, you know, the issue we're facing is so critical that we don't have time to, you know, that regulations are holding us back is the uh, idea. But that, but, but the Ebola outbreak, they actually um, mirrored uh, a lot of the vaccine response to the Ebola outbreak actually mirrored a lot of the same things that we saw with COVID. And it's interesting that, uh, you know, Welcome Trust was affiliated with it then, just like they were uh, affiliated with it with COVID, um, with Jeremy Farrar being, you know, in the Fauci emails actually seemed to be above Fauci in the chain of command. And a lot of his emails were redacted in those, uh, 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 emails that were leaked by the, or not leaked, but that were, um, you know, given by a FOIA request. But so it's, it's really, really, you know, suspicious stuff. And, um, that, it actually leads into my next question uh, for you, which is, um, you know, one of the things that you charge Kennedy with the most critics of his campaign have ignored completely is his weakness on speaking about COVID origin specifically the role of the role of people like Fauci and, and, um, welcome trust director, Jeremy Farrar in manufacturing the, the Nature magazine article, Proximal Origins, which was very influential at the time. It was basically the thing that mainstream media referred to, um, along with the other letter. I forgot what it was called that was um, released Lancet, two weeks right. after. The Lancet letter, which was primarily organized by Dazek, at least publicly. But Farrar potentially could have been the real architect of that. Yeah. He signed, and, um, he signed it. Oh, he signed it. Okay. Yeah, Farrar is uh, the only person that we know for certain was involved in both pillars of propaganda, in both the Lancet letter, mm-hmm. which uh, uh, dismissed the possibility of uh, COVID lab origins as a quote unquote conspiracy theory. They actually used that term. Um, and uh, and then the, um, the uh, 
proximal origins things, which Anderson and Gary signed, and Farrar had a massive role in, as did Fauci, but didn't sign. Yeah, uh, it's weird. Farrar has his hands in almost like every uh, pandemic related, um, you know, issue of the last maybe like 20 years or maybe longer than that. Um, un- the website Unlimited Hangout uh, has done a lot of reporting on Farrar and his connections to all of this stuff, if anyone wants to look into it. Yep. Um, and uh, uh, c- c- so can you talk a little bit, you've done a lot of reporting on the COVID origins. So can you talk a little bit about the reality of the co- COVID origins and why it's concerning for a candidate who is, you know, like RFK, who has positioned himself specifically as anti-establishment on this issue of COVID to remain silent about this. And I think that he tweeted, um, I can't remember exactly what he said. I think it was in one of your articles that, um, you know, uh, we have to focus on making, uh, you know, the future safe, right? We can't be playing this blame game and whose fault it was. And it kind of reminded me of um, Obama's thing right. about uh, it's good. Bush. Well, oh, you know, let's just focus forward. It's about working together and not blaming people of the past, right? right? And to me, that's a pretty big red flag. So can you um, talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, You know, I I mean, it should be elections have consequences, right? That's what we how we should look at this. And there was a massive propaganda effort to dismiss the possibility of lab origins uh, put out by the Lancet, by Nature Medicine and throughout the major media. Uh, Congress has done virtually nothing on this. Um, It actually fits into a pattern. And Kennedy was on Carlson and he actually started talking about the anthrax attacks, which I talk about endlessly um, and which Whitney Webb of Unlimited Hangout and myself and others have connected through personnel to COVID. Um, And um, people might recall the the anthrax attacks. Um, You guys are really young. Um, (laughs) The anthrax attacks happened right after the 9-11 attacks, anthrax was mailed um, uh, to media outlets and to the two senators who were holding up uh, the Patriot Act, which was an attack on civil liberties. Um, And uh, it was blamed at the time on Al Qaeda and or Iraq. And it ended up coming out of a US lab or US or US allied lab. Kennedy claims that it was the CIA lab in uh, Fort Detrick. Fort Detrick isn't a CIA lab. (laughs) Fort Detrick is a military lab. Uh, and we don't know that it was Fort Detrick. It could have been one of like three or four other places that are all, but they're all U.S. or U.S. allied. Um, this is a major scandal. And so Congress was went under a false flag bioweapons attack and Congress has never investigated it. It's insane. I mean, compare that to, you know, what happened on January 6th and how many hearings they've had on that. Um, and this was also at the time when they launched the Afghan war. So it put everybody in a state of fear, tremendous thing. Flash forward to um, COVID, similar massive state of fear uh, throughout the country uh, and big tech, big media, most politicians dismiss the possibility of lab origins of COVID. Um, and especially, you know, including, you know, so-called progressive liberal media, whatever, they're even worse. Um, some on the right do it, but sort of as a way of targeting China. So that has negative consequences. Um, and so what needs to happen is that you need to get to the bottom of what happened with COVID origins. There have been, as you indicate, some FOIAs, some Freedom of Information Act, but it's been very limited, very limited. Um, and crucially, it only begins on uh, January 30th, 2020. Mm -hmm. Uh, There's a lot that comes after January 30th, 2020, a lot more that I wanna see, but I especially wanna see what happened before January 30th, 2020. You know, who's the first person in the US government to figure out that it might've had lab origin? Um, Who was the first person to try to cover up that it might've had lab origin? What was Jeremy Farrar and Fauci doing in January? December and uh, November of 2020. I want to know. We don't know that. Um, yeah. Um, just just one thing, just one interesting thing to point out real quick is uh, mm-hmm. Andrew Pollard, who works for the Jenner Institute and heads the Oxford Vaccine Group, 
um, who is uh, one of the people involved at, you know, at the head of developing the AstraZeneca vaccine. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was in, uh, I think it was before Jan, it was definitely before January 30th, I believe. Um, but I, I don't know exactly when, but before then it was in January. Uh, he was already beginning to work on the COVID-19 vaccine and he has ties to Farrar uh, and the Wellcome Trust and things like that. So yeah, I agree with you. There's something to point out. Yeah. There's, there's lots there. And it, it is tied. I mean, I didn't get into the whole vaccine question, which is what you're, you know, I, I didn't, you know, I just got into the origins question. Um, yeah. There, there, there is a massive case to be made that it, that COVID had lab origins um, and uh, that there was a massive propaganda effort to dismiss that possibility. And a lot of people stayed silent who knew damn well better. Um, whether they were intimidated or just didn't want to go against the conventional wisdom or whatever is a question and it needs to be answered, I think. Um, and a lot of people went into massive propaganda. And, you know, we should just clarify for, for folks listening, if they're not familiar, Jeremy Farrar was head of the Wellcome Trust, which is a, a, a nonprofit in England that came out of a pharmaceutical merger. There were a series of pharmaceutical mergers with Glasgow Smith Klein, and the Wellcome Trust was the uh, nonprofit spinoff. And it's basically has acted like the Gates Foundation um, in the UK. Chief scientist there, he propagandized about COVID origins like nobody else. Um, and he, at the beginning of this year, became chief scientist for the WHO. You would think that Robert Kennedy would be screaming his head off about this. He's not. Why isn't yeah. Robert Kennedy screaming his head off about Jeremy Farrar? He's not retired like Fauci. Okay, Fauci's, you know, got some, you know, cushy gig at Georgetown where he doesn't have to teach now. He's, you know, presumably retired. Okay, so you don't want to go after Fauci. And, and, and you're right. I mean, and, and Kennedy got blowback. You know, he put out that tweet. I think referring to Fauci, we need to look forward, this this line. And then his activist base said, what the hell are you saying? You wrote a book on Fauci, this guy engaged in all of this fraudulent activity and you just want to forget about it? And he was like, no, 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 you know, I don't want to forget, you know, we, we, you know, but we, you know, so, you know, he sort of backtracked. But, you know, there's all, I, I, what I'm saying is that activists got to keep talking back to this guy. You know, it, you know, it can't be Kennedy says, x so we support kennedy so we got to back him up right no he has to back us up he has to back up you know it, it, it should be a totally different paradigm where the politicians are actually supposed to reflect what their activist base believes and make the connections um, that that genuine activists and grassroots people want to push them in um so um, so yeah, so Jeremy Farrar is, um, you know, now chief scientist of the WHO. And I think you, you've done some work on this, Max, the, uh, you probably know more about this in terms of the WHO is involved in a power grab now. In terms yeah, of the, uh, there, there, there's being, um, James Rose got Rogusky is a journalist that has done, uh, pretty mm -hmm. extensive work on it, but there's uh, proposed amendments to the, uh, international health regulations that would give things that would do things like give the director general the power to just determine, uh, without any kind of like, you know, check or vote to approve it when there's a pandemic and thus when these emergency measures get to be implemented, for example, that's just one of the things. I mean, 20 years ago, you had people in an uproar about the potential for the World Trade Organization um, doing a power grab, using trade as a pretext to implement undemocratic processes that violated the sovereignty of various countries. Um, and that culminated in large part with what was called the Battle of Seattle in 1999, where you literally had riots in the streets of Seattle, I was there, um, it, you know, with, you know, to, to, to tell the WO that was having a meeting there, World Trade Organization, that you can't do this. Uh, now, with so many liberals having gone along with the COVID narrative, uh, I think that there, there, there's a strong case to be made that the World Health Organization is, in effect, doing much the same thing, uh, using 
setting itself up to be using uh, authoritarian methods to be implementing policies that are going to sidetrack democratic processes and infringe on sovereignty of countries around the world. Um, and I haven't done a ton of work on it, but it's a major concern. And again, you would think that Kennedy would be screaming his head off about this. Why isn't yeah. he? Why isn't he? So the, 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 the threat here, I believe, is that Kennedy is a, a sheep goat or a, a Judas goat, a sheep dog or a Judas goat, let me get it straight, <laughs> um, to, uh, to, in effect, euthanize the movement for accountability around the pandemic and, and that in this quest for presidency and notoriety and money and whatever else that that message and that criticism that needs to happen will be sidetracked and it's doubly weird because he's um still you know he's like the chairman on leave for children's health defense which is an organization that has done a lot of work on these issues but you know that they're not in much of a position to criticize him he's still their president their chairman emeritus um so you know if it were another candidate potentially who was pretending to be good on the pandemic but wasn't actually saying what needed to be said they might criticize him but they're not going to criticize him he's their chairman emeritus um so it's a weird and they're the biggest group i mean i don't always agree with them and you know and and, you know again i you know i didn't get a ton into the vaccine stuff i got into the COVID origin stuff and other dangerous lab work it's weird it's a weird situation that that you know that the biggest organization can't be in a position of criticizing a candidate who ostensibly is good on these issues but hasn't really given voice in a meaningful way i mean i mean i'm sure that he said something somewhere about the who i assume i i would guess that he said something at some point but i haven't seen it on his twitter feed he goes on rogan reaches millions of people for three hours and can't talk about gain of function or WHO. What the hell? What the <laughs> hell is going on here? That's my point. And meanwhile, as we say, and by the way, another thing, going back to the Israel thing, if I might. One thing that he said is that my family has always backed Israel. That's not really true. Uh, rhetorically, officially, John F. JFK and RFK backed Israel. But if you really get into what they actually did, not so. The organization that he get got his advisor from, this guy Klein, American Zionist um, organization, his father, when he was attorney general, RFK was JFK's attorney general, he went after them saying, you guys are a foreign agent and you've got to register as a foreign agent. Uh, this would have had I- impact in terms of APAC, uh, what you know, the huge pro-Israel lobby in the United States. Um, and when Johnson got in, he stopped all of that. He stopped all the legal action of scrutinizing the Israel lobby. People talk about you know Russia Gate and Russia influence and so on. Israel has far more influence uh, over U.S. policy, and that 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 just you know, given a pass. Now, I mean, obviously there are a lot of U.S. citizens, some Jews, some non-Jews that belong to these organizations, but how closely tied are they to the Israeli government um, is a major question. And Robert Kennedy Sr. attempted to make them register as foreign agents. Another thing, John F. Kennedy Jr., um, and I'm I have a piece on this. I'll probably write a piece about the Robert Kennedy thing um, coming up, but I have a piece on the uh, JFK thing. He tried to stop Israel from getting nuclear weapons. Um, it, you know, if you go to a U.S. politician now, and I've done, done this to many of them, including at the State Department re- most recently, you know, do you acknowledge that Israel has nuclear weapons? They will not even acknowledge the empirical reality of Israel's nuclear weapons arsenal, which is, you know, it's like the elephant in the room in terms of... You, you questioned the State Department on that, right? I did. I did. And they won't yeah. acknowledge it. 
they will not acknowledge that Israel has nuclear weapons. They'll buck and dodge and say, oh, we want Israel to sign the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. <laughs> what does that mean? It's an empirical question. Um, and, you know, you know, politician after politician would not. Jimmy Carter, my piece on Jimmy Carter, Jimmy Carter lied to me. I didn't know it at the time. I questioned him, why, you know, you know, about Israel's nuclear weapons. You know, why didn't you acknowledge that they have them? And he said, I didn't feel like it was up to me to say when other countries had nuclear weapons. I later did some research and found out that actually Carter's White House did say that Pakistan had nuclear weapons before Pakistan declared and cut off funding for Pakistan for that because they were proliferating nuclear weapons because there's a law on the books in the united states if you proliferate nuclear weapons you get a cut off of funding which should be implemented on israel but it's not so it's only applied selectively it's only applied selectively in part because the u.s refuses to acknowledge the empirical reality of israel's massive nuclear weapons arsenal and we know that israel has nuclear weapons because Mordecai Venunu, an incredible person, sacrificed himself and ended up in solitary confinement for over a decade for blowing the whistle and exposing the documents, including pictures that were published by the Sunday Times of London. And he's still not allowed out of Israel. You know, he's like pleaded for years. Somebody let me, I think he's under like quasi house arrest, like he's only allowed to go into a part of Jerusalem where he lives. Uh, I, I met him in, at a you know at a hotel in Jerusalem a couple of years ago. Um, you know, it's only because of his sacrifice that we know for certain that Israel has nuclear weapons. But going back to JFK, JFK tried to get Israel to you know, to say you need we're going to have inspections and we're going to have inspections ASAP. He's writing Ben Gurion, who was then Prime Minister, um, in the summer of. Uh, 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 of 63. It, it, it was just the anniversary of it. And that's why I, you know, part of the reason I wrote it up. Um, and Ben Gurion is ducking and stalling for time. And he's obviously ducking and stalling because he doesn't want inspections because he wants to build the facility in such a way that they could hide what they're doing. And he's saying, oh, we can do it early next year. We can do it in early 64. Can we do inspections then? And Kennedy's like, no, my scientists are telling me the inspections have to happen now. And then Kennedy sends him another letter that is, you know, by diplomatic standards, very threatening. He starts talking about endangering our relationship. Um, And what happens? The day before the letter is to be delivered, Ben-Gurion resigns allegedly for personnel, personal reasons. So, you know, then Kennedy is forced to deal with his successor and his successor is the finance minister and his finance minister is like, you know, I don't know what's going on here. Let me get up to speed. And then November rolls around, Kennedy's assassinated. And then finally inspections happen in 1964, just like Ben Gurion wanted. And, you know, they get the run around and, so did Ben Gurion come back after he resigned after Kennedy was assassinated? I believe he or? did eventually, not right away. But uh, you know, the, the, the stipulation is that Ben Gurion was like, you know, you know, the power behind the throne kind of thing. Uh, I can uh, I should look that up. I didn't go back to that in my timeline. That's a good question. Yeah. I mean, yeah, take your time. Yeah, it was funny to me that. Um, that, uh, you know, that he resigned just before that. Um, no, he didn't come back. He didn't come back. Okay. He resigned on um, the 26th of June, 1963, and didn't come back officially. But I think he was, you know, sort of still seen as the elder statesman. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. That's very interesting. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah. So, or, or Diego, you had a question about uh, uh, vote pack. Sorry. Yeah, Go please. Ahead. We really haven't gotten into vote pack, and I, I know we're running on to an hour close. So. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So uh, this could maybe maybe we could wrap it up with this, and then obviously there's. I think we we've learned a ton here, and we we'd love to to follow up on a lot of things here because I uh, you know sure. I found this conversation very fascinating. But yeah, vote pack, which is your project, correct? That attempts to align anti-establishment um, voices on both the left and the right to um, come together and oppose, you know, the, the, the force, the powers that be in the establishment. Right. Um, at, at least for me, I was curious, you know, you, you brought up something like the rage against the war machine rally is a sort of, um, example of what the left, this left, right nexus could look like. And from what I've seen of the rally, I mean, in person and across the internet, there wasn't a, a whole ton of support. But what I did notice is there's a lot. There was a lot, a big effort in in, in smearing it and making it seem to be uh, all the, all this all these different things. So I, I was just curious of how you know how something like vote pack can come up against not just you know uh, can come up against you know the, the inverse of it of itself I guess which is the left and the right establishment uh, coming down on it if if you know what i'm what i'm saying yeah no i mean that's what that's the world that we live in the 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 the, the, you know democratic and republican or whatever you want to call them parts of the establishment they kind of pretend to fight but they actually collude um yeah in terms of wall street and war and whatever other uh, surveillance uh big tech you know whatever they you know work for their mutual benefit. And I'm saying that the anti-establishment forces need to get out from under attempts to separate them. Um, and there are a lot of ways that that can be done, but at the voting level, um, you know, for lack of a better term, a disenchanted Democrat, a disenchanted Republican can both pair up and both vote for the anti-establishment candidate of their choice. <laughs> So, like, if you have a campaign that can draw support from both the left and the right, like I, I, what I always used to talk about, imagine a combination of Kucinich and uh, 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 Ron Paul, right? You know, uh, pro peace, pro civil liberties, uh, anti corporate power. Um, you know, and, you know, critical of corporate trade deals, all, all of these things, um, you could get support from both the left and the right, and people could pair up and support such a candidate. So I, what I've wanted is a unification. I mean, I did everything but plead for Nader to do this. He didn't. He got, what, 2.6% or something. Um, I tried to get Jill Stein to do this. She didn't. She got, what, 1% or something. Um, the only major thing who, that did do this is a group that backed um, Gary Johnson, who was the Libertarian candidate in 2016. And they put out a very entertaining video called With Dead A. Blinken. Uh, and they got 37 million views on um, Facebook and, um, you know, and they actually had a software mechanism to pair people up and, you know, I, I, I've always envisioned vote pact working people in your life, you know, like you people and their friend will, or relative or spouse or neighbor or debating partner will cancel out each other's vote. Right. One self-loathingly voting for Biden and one self-loathingly voting for Trump. I'm saying stop canceling out each other. And if you, you, if you know and trust each other, both vote for the candidates that you most want. Now, they could when one could vote for green or socialist and one could vote libertarian or constitution. But ideally, they could both vote for an anti-establishment unified candidate that was is the path to a peaceful electoral revolution in the united states it is people coming together from the left and right saying we disagree on a lot of stuff but let's at least get the core things that we care about the most and, and which oftentimes are at the root of a problem 
right? Like, uh, like the left and right are, disagree on immigration, but the, they agree on the root ca- causes of immigration, of uh, mm. desperate immigration, the wars, the corporate trade deals, the drug wars. Those are the things that cause desperate immigration. So if you actually win on what you agree with, the things that you disagree with, a lot of them go away. And, you know, but the establishment loves to have, you know, cultural issues where the left and right argue to no end about things while war war and Wall Street rule. Um, So I view Vote Pact as potentially a key thing for doing it. Now, my problem with like Cornell West doesn't seem, oh, oh, and I should take Gary Johnson. So, you know, this group backed Gary Johnson and did this. Gary Johnson was not an effective candidate uh, at all, but he still got more votes than anybody since Perot. He got more votes than Nader. He got, he got like, I don't know, three or four percent. Um, so, uh, and I think part of that is that this, the, the they, they took my idea, Vote Pact, and they rebranded it as the Balanced Rebellion, which I admit is a good name. And they had, you know, they, 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 they did a very competent, they ripped me off. I'm mad about that. <laughs> <laughs> but they did a good job. So I'm happy about that. Um, but, you know, they, they were only interested in that one campaign. And I'm saying this has to be a movement. We have to set up mechanisms where the left and right, you know, cooperate and dialogue and strategically come together. I'm not asking people to pretend that they totally agree with each other to deny who they are, uh, but to strategically work together. And I think that there's a huge opening. The problem is that Kennedy in effect is splintering things further. As I've argued, West doesn't seem to have any way of appealing to the right. He could, Mm -hmm. if he started, getting serious about pandemic narrative issues. I mean, imagine if he started talking about COVID origins or uh, the power, you know, civil liberties in terms of personal freedom, um, in in terms of medical decisions and so on. Uh, He could do that still. Um, It's not clear where the Libertarian Party is in this coming election. They have a huge opportunity if they pick the right candidates to do this. Um, And they, they have massive ballot access um, so, you know, that, that, that's, that's what I see. That's the opportunity that I see. Um, and those are the obstacles that I see and what I, I think could be a pivotal way that there, there is massive discontent among the American public with the establishment, but the establishment has so far succeeded in splintering groups and marginalizing them and setting them off against each other. Uh, and you see that, you know, you're getting a circular firing squad between the Kennedy and the Cornell West people. Um, and mm. I think there should be criticism, but, and I hope that it would lead to Cornell West getting a better clue about pandemic issues and, and Kennedy getting a better clue on Israel, most obviously. Um, so that, that, that's, that's what I see. Yeah. And, and, and so kind of, one of the things that's I, that sounds like inherent in this strategy is admitting that, like, as a third party candidate, your goal is not necessarily to uh, beat, you know, well, maybe maybe ultimately, yes. But 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 also the the even if the campaign loses the, you know, like it does like your candidate doesn't win the presidency, which is unlikely in America. Right. For a third a third party to win the presidency uh, or whichever political uh, you know, office you're running for, um, that, uh, uh, that these campaigns are often like, like a movement, right? So, uh, a, a, a protest vote and a way of actually funneling votes out of the party duopoly into something that's, that actually makes your vote worth something instead of canceling out each other or voting for, you know, if you're like, uh, or voting for Joe Biden in California, where I live, for example, or like, or, or Trump, where, you know, neither is going to matter. Your vote can actually mean something if you uh, uh, funnel it out of the party duopoly. And the thing that I find interesting about Vote Pact and that I re- that really appeals to me is that it doesn't revolve around, um, you know, focusing on one personality or one person. It involves on making your vote actually um, an action in terms of, uh, you know, 
making a declaration that you will not participate in the system that continuously screws people over. And I think that like that's something that really should be talked about in 2024 because we have a lot of candidates that are, you know, interesting compared to the uh, normal kind of candidates that ran, you know, like in the Obama years and before that, right? You have that guy Vivek, um, I don't know how you say his last name, Ramaswamy or something. Right. Um, you have uh, RFK um, and Trump, right? These people that kind of appear anti-establishment, but like we've said, like historically, these movements kind of, uh, you know, they act as Judas, uh, Judas goats, right? Uh, was the or or sheep dogs? Um, so yeah, I think if anything, this is like the main time to focus on it in the midst of 2024, when you have in every direction you have an anti-established candidate potentially that's looking to kind of sheepdog you into this uh, party duopoly once again and divide the anti-establishment um, base. Yeah, I, I, I think you're hitting on something really important that elections have served as movement killers at times because it forces everyone back into their partisan boxes. Like you can mm -hmm. have people talking, you know, across, maybe not just now, but in the past you have had that. And then people go back into their partisan boxes so that everything revolves around. I got to talk about how bad Trump is today because we got to, we got to keep him out of the White House. And their whole world revolves around that. And I'm saying, no, your whole world revolves around pursuing interests of justice and peace and thing, issues that you care about and not getting sucked into loving and hating politicians. Um, but I should say. What I'm arguing for opens the door for a literal electoral victory, right? I mean, I think, and there are whole mechanisms to prevent that, like, like the way that polls are done. Polls are, never ask who people want to be president. They always say, if the election were held today, who would you vote for? And that forces people into this mm. confine of saying, oh, you know, I, you know, like in the 2000 election, a lot of people, if they asked that, would have said Nader. I, I want Nader to be president. I'm not going to vote for him because I got to vote for Gore because I don't want Bush. Um, you know, um, so there is the possibility of vote pact leading to literal electoral victory. It would require a lot of things. It would require a compelling candidate who's articulate, real support from the left and right that's based on dialogue and ballot access. Those are substantial obstacles, but it is possible. Given the tools of U.S. democracy, it is possible. Um, so I, I, that, that, that's the only part of what the way that you summarized it that I might take exception with now. Yeah, no, I, I uh, that that's yeah, no, I agree. I mean, there's I have to like I'm not super well versed in electoral politics, but I could say I mean like the the fact that this one guy that um what's what's his name that did it uh that ripped you off Gary Johnson or Gary Johnson. It wasn't actually him. It was a group that was backing him called the Balanced Rebellion. Okay, okay, yeah. Um, I mean, the fact that they using this strategy got more than Nader with him being, as you said, like a pretty ineffective candidate. Correct. speaks to the the power of um of a uh, vote pact and i mean like yeah i mean i, I hope that uh uh it gets spread around more seriously but it's hard because of how suppressed um independent media and voices like yourself are on um yeah. twitter and and, and and how much so much media further makes everything into a sectarian issue Put mm -hmm. everybody into their little boxes yeah. yeah and i feel like that's came up a lot especially with again to go back to the the rally um rage against the war machine rally where uh, you know seeing it develop and seeing the attacks again uh, against it, it they came from like almost every angle calling it right. you know pointing right. out certain members calling it anti-black all, all these kind of attacks came came from everywhere and it's right. just it's and, and i'm curious to see how yeah yeah, and I'm sure that there's some legitimate criticism there, as yeah. there is for anything. But I think that it's an aversion to the concept of left-right cooperation because it's so threatening. 
right? Because it could spell the doom to everybody's addicted to this duopoly um, and to a world that actually, where you actually have what I would call a radical center that exists but is suppressed coming to the fore and genuinely challenging the economic powers and the militaristic powers that ultimately rule much of our world. You, you use that phrase radical center in another recent article, right? Talking about this Oliver Anthony character that's emerged recently, right? The, the, the guy character? Who, Oliver Anthony, right? That's oh, yeah, the, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. The, the song. The, the uh, yeah. Rich men of, yeah, of, of North Richmond. Yeah, um, I mean... Mm-hmm. No, yeah. yeah, I was just wondering, maybe you can expand on that and, and kind of talk about what what he brings up and why maybe it resonated so much in, in the way that it did i mean i know there's also speculation uh and about you know his background or whatever who who he may be affiliated with but yeah. regardless the message is there yeah regardless of his background or who he's affiliated with and i mean you know i i wouldn't i wouldn't be shocked if you know i wouldn't be shocked if he were like a trump figure right who talks anti-establishment in a really compelling way and is ultimately going to sell out that's completely possible. Um, but like Trump, he is giving voice in a very legitimate way to um, very real things in terms of, you know, surveillance. He even talk, you know, he makes a reference to Epstein, which, you know, much of the left is skittish about, but is a substantial issue um, uh, and could actually be related to Kennedy, to be honest with you. That could be another possibility of one level of control over a politician like Kennedy. Um, um, and, but, it, you know, at the core of it, of working class, class grievance, like I'm, I'm, you know, I'm working overtime hours for bullshit pay. Bravo. A hell of a lot of people feel that way. Why can't, you know, you know, and, uh, you know, I, I know Billy Bragg wrote a song that was sort of like in response to it, but, Put me to sleep. Um, <laughs> uh, Dave, Dave Rovix, who's a friend, uh, wrote a just rewrote the song, just changed one or two of the verses, uh, and made it about corporate welfare rather than overweight people on welfare, which I thought was a great response. And, and actually, I love the way that, that Dave Rovix sang it. So, yeah, well, I oh, just, just wanted to throw in um, I, Oliver Anthony. Um, I think his name is actually Christian or Christopher Anthony or something, but uh, uh, he went on Joe Rogan, I think like yesterday oh, yeah. or a couple days ago. Okay. Yeah. And I, and I watched like maybe 20 to 30 minutes of the interview and he did talk about corporate welfare um, kind of yeah. briefly, but he did talk about how he doesn't really understand corporate welfare either. And um, you know, why he thinks, uh, why he never, I think he's talked about why, GM got bailed out after the recession and other people didn't. And um, well, Rogan went on to that's the least of defense it. for. Yeah, G- GM is the least of it. I mean, corporate yeah, corporate welfare is huge. I mean, it's all the big banks got bailed out. Uh, was it? I mean, the entire internet is a whole. It's a huge example of corporate welfare. You know, like you know, the our tax dollars built the internet and then it got privatized. Uh, mm. and it's insane. Um, so there's so many aspects to that. So. Hopefully he'll educate himself. But, um, yeah. Well, um, thank you, Sam, for thank you. It's been a pleasure, gentlemen. Uh, yeah, it's been an absolute pleasure. This was a really great conversation. And uh, if you want to tell people um, yeah. where to find your work, and if you're if you want to tease anything that you're working on currently, so people can look out for it. Sure. Um, uh, well, uh, I write at Substack. Uh, so it's Husseini, H-U-S-S-E-I-N-I dot Substack dot com. Um, and I'm on Twitter and a couple of other platforms at Sam Husseini. Um, uh, I'm continuing to work on COVID origins um, issues. Um, and uh, uh, like I said, I'll probably do a couple more deep dives into Kennedy West. And uh, uh, I still actually have several pieces in the works on not not just the Ebola um, uh, out, outbreak um, um, and how that was covered up at the time, because I went back to 2014 and people who've written books about the Ebola outbreak in 2014 
um, some of them funded by the Gates Foundation. Um, uh, I'm digging on that. And I'm also doing, in effect, profiles of different scientists who are engaging in dangerous lab work. I just did one on uh, a scientist at the uh, University of Wisconsin, and they're trying to pass legislation there um, to stop him. Um, uh, he resurrected the Spanish flu. Um, it's insane what they're doing. Um, and other scientists are around the country, and I'm hoping to really profile and dig into who's funding them and what the nature is of their dangerous lab work. Great. That sounds like insanely important work, and we'd love to have you back on to talk about that. Um, yeah, thank you again. We really appreciate it. Thanks, Sam. It's been a pleasure. Max, Diego, thank you so much.